favourite holiday destination for the Harrington clan was a friend's family farm in Oruru. That's in the mid-north of South Australia. We love the open spaces, riding on the back of their ute around the property, watching the sheep being sheared. We'd set out on that journey, lots of excitement, uh, but it wasn't uncommon for one or more of the children to get grumpy or irritable or sick of travelling along the way. They didn't understand the concept of delayed gratification. As a parent, we had the job of urging patients, telling them why it was worthwhile going on, uh, helping them to cope along the way with car sickness or boredom or irritation or with each other or, or whatever it was. We never considered giving up the trip or chucking one of the children out of the car to fend for themselves. Or or not for very long, anyway. (laughs) A a very real part of the joy of being in Oruru was to be there together as a family. Our Christian life is like that, isn't it? There'll be great joy when we get to the end and we're all there together. Won't that be just wonderful? There'll be enormous joy in that. We need to urge each other on. No one in the family is, is dispensable. But unlike a painful holiday trip where the end result of actually getting there is worthwhile, on the Christian journey, there's not only joy in the end, but there also is real joy with suffering, uh, but real joy along the way. We're having, as you've seen today, a real focus on joy in Jesus as we explore Philippians. And chapter four, looking at this last chapter, we'll consider now what promotes perseverance, standing firm, pressing on both individually, but also as communities that love Jesus. What we'll see is things that promote joy, but also the opposites, things that rob joy. Paul tells the Philippians to stand firm in the Lord. If you want to uh, follow on in chapter 4, it's on page 7 in the booklet. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. So the therefore refers to what's gone before uh, about rejoicing in the Lord as he forgets what lies behind, in verse 13, uh, and in uh, verse 14, press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So rejoicing in the Lord, forgetting what's behind, pressing on. It sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it, to stand firm by pressing on. (laughs) Standing firm involves keeping our eyes on the prize, holding on to the truth, and growing in the truth of Jesus. The Philippians were really proud of their Roman citizenship, and Paul encourages them by saying, verse 20 in chapter 3, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Their real citizenship is in heaven, eyes on heaven, eyes on the prize. That's what we need to do. Their real Lord is Jesus, and that by his overarching power, he'll transform their bodies to be like his glorious body. They can persevere during their earthly life because they know where they belong. They know where they're heading and how wonderful it will be. When Jesus returns, there'll be extraordinary blessings in store for his people, including a new eternal body like Jesus. No more effects of gravity, (laughs) um, no more age, no more sickness, no more pain, no more weariness or stress, no more struggle with sin. That'll be over. Our desires and our actions and our emotions will be completely in sync We won't be living in the brokenness of the world anymore. I can't wait. How about you? So delayed gratification now is worth it. It really is worth the effort and sometimes the struggle now. It is really worth being careful, careful to make sure that nothing stops us or others from receiving that ultimate joy. 
For the Christian person, our sure knowledge of this future joy for ourselves and for other believers has impact on us now. It shapes our daily living, our daily life and our daily joys in many ways. In verse, uh, Paul um, uh, goes on and says there in verse, chapter 4, verse 4, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Oh, sorry. And then he goes on it in verse 4 to say um, what will help us do it. They are unity in the Lord. So that's chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Prayer and relying on God, verses 4 to 7. Dwelling on the good, verses 8 to 9. And contentment and generosity, verses 10 to 19. All of those things promote joy in Jesus' family, and we'll have a look at them now. The opposites, of course, to those joy promoters are joy killers, and they inhibit our standing and pressing on well. Their ungodly conflict, staying anxious, focusing on the bad, and dis- discontentment and greed. Well, firstly, where this fighting and disunity within the Christian community, it's so damaging. It can break up communities and churches or Bible study groups. It can suck the joy and life out of a community and damage people's witness and uh, faith, their own personal faith in God. Now, actually, that's why I do want to take this opportunity to urge my dear sisters Chris and some, I heard them out the back late, yelling at each other about the song choice, and Anne, I want you to work with them to help them sort it out. Okay, it's all a bit confronting, didn't happen. All a bit confronting, isn't it? But that's actually what Paul did publicly in this letter. It was, it's a very big step. He, it was so important. Read with me uh, on page seven, chapter four, verse two and three. He said, I plead with the Odita and I plead with Sintiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. It's quite an quite interesting thing that is done here. Uh, they are believers, they love the gospel, but there's something going on. They weren't false teachers, they were clearly keen gospel workers and leaders in the church, which was probably why it was more public, um, but for some reason they weren't getting on. We don't know why. Perhaps they had a personality clash, perhaps they disagreed how women's ministry should be run at Philippi, we just don't know. But Paul sees this conflict as a significant problem and as a, actually as a risk to the church. And so he asks another leader, it was obviously the person carrying the letter, to help them. That person is to be some sort of mediator or agent for reconciliation. A major theme throughout Philippians is agreeing in the Lord, having the same mind. He's talked a lot about not being self-centred or envious, not having selfish ambition, putting the gospel and others above our own interest. Now he urges these two women to put into practice these things in their particular circumstance. Have you noticed he's not actually saying one is right and the other is wrong? Uh, He's not putting them down, but he is speaking to them as family members, as friends, as sisters, and saying they do actually need to sort it out. They need to agree that honouring Jesus and loving his people is more important than their current views or their current positions or their feelings. In their situation, they also need to be humble enough to let another person help them doing it. Verse 5 goes on to say, let your gentleness be evident to all. It's very pertinent here as the word gentleness is more like forbearance. It's the opposite to self-seeking or contentious. These women weren't to focus on getting their own way, but on big gospel family issues. They are to be known for being humble, Jesus-centred and other person-centred. Now, this isn't saying there should be gospel unity at at the expense of core gospel truths. That's a logical impossibility, isn't it? You know, you can't have gospel unity without the gospel. Um, We saw how Paul spoke about the circumcision group in chapter 3. And neither is he saying that they have to agree in the Lord, um, that to agree in the Lord, they have to agree on every secondary Christian issue. He's saying that our Lord is too wonderful and our fellowship is too important, our mission is too important to get caught up in trivia 
or even secondary issues that actually might have some importance. They can't be raised to first order. Both Eurodia and Syntyche have their names, verse 3, in the book of life. So they've got to get perspective here on all that they have in common. They're going to be in heaven forever together. I remember my husband saying once when we're setting the ground rules for a new church that was being planted, and he said, we'll fight for the gospel, that Jesus is God, that his salvation is through Christ alone, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose again, that he's coming back, but we're not going to fight about music, details of when Jesus will return, communion, baptism, women's ministry, social, political action, homeschooling, or whatever the list goes on. We're actually not going to fight about any of those things. Fighting about those things rob Christian community joy. Just think about the times where you've prayed and worked together well with other Christians, um, where you've all been on the same page, or when you've seen others doing that. Isn't it a joy? Doesn't it bring joy to your heart? Um, if you didn't have gospel concerns or care for God's people, it wouldn't bring you joy. But if you do, then your heart is filled with joy at such things. Um, We've got a children's evangelistic event called Christmas Steps each year um, at Christmas. And the Christmas story is told and there's various spots all around the, the, the church property. Um, last year, there were over 150 volunteers. And everybody involved, young people, old people, some of the young people who'd um, uh, been little kids at one stage were now you know, playing the main roles in all the different plays and things around the place. And it really gave me such joy to see everybody chipping in, everybody working uh, for a gospel purpose that was beyond themselves. Those sort of things uh, are a little bit of a taste of heaven. But the flip side's also true, isn't it? When we hold a grudge against someone in the church, we often feel quite disturbed and quite flat. Um, We can even have a grudge against the church itself, forgetting actually that the church is us. I'm embarrassed to say, and they can be big or little things, Um, I'm embarrassed to say that I once felt irritated and out of sorts for about three weeks in a row because the coffee plungers that I'd bought and and got to be used weren't being used. Um, Goodness sake, the big things of life. (laughs) You know, how petty. But it can happen, can't it? We can lose our focus as to what are the important things. Are you sometimes tempted to think you're more godly than you are. Conflict with another person is a reality check uh, on that often. It can be an indicator of of where you are, where your own heart is. Um, In conflict situations, I need to battle with my own heart. Um, It's even harder if you're feeling protective for your husband or your children, don't you reckon? You can suddenly feel the lioness, I do, bubbling up, you know, (laughs) Um, you know, you can replay the situation in your mind uh, and saying the things you'd really like to say, but really you're much too godly to say, you know. <laughs> but God knows your heart, and you know what I mean, don't you? Being a wife or a mother or a daughter or a friend doesn't give me or you a free pass on being godly. And agreeing in the Lord or having the same mind in the Lord with others in God's family. It's important to work hard, isn't it, at tempering our words and not stirring things up and getting other people worked up with taking sides, you know, the us versus them. So forget all the sort of, how dare you speak to you like that or that's just like her or those sort of comments. And it's important not to get sucked in, isn't it, to putting other people down and to gossiping. Um, And we may just have to bear the implied rebuke, you know, if you really loved me, you'd join in on this, you'd be for me in this. Let's be honest, if you're in a conflict situation, it's highly unlikely that you haven't sinned, even if it's in your own heart in response to their totally unreasonable (laughs) behaviour. You are likely to need God's help um, to to keep your, to keep pressing on, to learn to do what's good. Uh, but And if you don't work hard under God at that, our joy and the joy of others around us will shrivel up. We need Jesus to do his work in our lives individually and as a community. Disunity is a joy killer. It, in, it endangers our progress individually and as a community. Agreeing in the Lord brings joy, helps us to stand firm and to press on together. 
So as far as it's within your power, and you can't do the impossible, but as far as it's within your power, agree in the Lord with other believers. The second joy promoter highlighted in chapter four, so it goes on from there and talks about relying on the Lord um, and praying to the Lord. And conversely, the joy killer is staying anxious. <clears throat> Whenever I look really hard at something in my own heart <clears throat> that needs to change, I'm driven again to look upwards to God, upwards and to pray. It's a funny mixture, don't you reckon, of being saddened by what you see in your own heart but also um, encouraged because we've got a God, a God that we can pray to um, and who will do his work in us. And even revealing it is part of that. We're told at verse 5, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So what exactly is being said here? To be honest, I'm not 100% sure on all of it. I think some of it's completely clear and some of it I'm not sure if I've got completely scum. So, but let's look at it together. Firstly, what is being talked about by the word anxious? Some anxiety can result from mental health issues, but Paul isn't saying don't have a mental health issue. Like he's not saying, you know, don't have bad eyesight or don't have a broken arm. Okay, so let's get that one out of the way. Also, I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think he's saying that all anxiety is wrong. Let me show you why. Paul's already said in chapter 2, verse 28, that one of the reasons he's sending Epaphroditus back to Paul is so that he'll have less anxiety. And in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 28 to 29, Paul says, I face day the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? In neither of these passages does he seem to imply that anxiety or passionate care in that way um, is wrong. So it looks like there could be some sort of worry or concern uh, that's appropriate and others that are definitely not. I think what Paul is definitely saying here is that self-focused anxiety is wrong, where it's about me, my life, my health, my possessions, my status. That's wrong. Whereas concern for things that God is concerned about, like church or other people or the gospel going out, are, are good um, uh, anxieties or passionate concerns. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34 has quite a bit to say about not being anxious about our life, what we'll eat, what we'll drink, what we'll wear, because that's what unbelievers run, over, run after. And we've got a powerful Heavenly Father who knows we need it. He cares about it. And anyway, um, it's completely unproductive. We can't add a single hour to our life. Anxiety here seems to be concerns over what's in, um, uh, which involves running after something. So instead of using your energy to do this, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. We should only be running after God. Rejoice in the Lord. Seek his kingdom and not worldly things. So while we've seen that Paul is anxious about the things of God, he doesn't let this anxiety lead him into sin. One of the things I struggle with is having a bit of a Messiah complex. I've got a big dose of compassion, which is good, but it can turn into thinking that it's up to me to fix things. Now that's actually ungodly. Um, and it's presumptuous. There's only one Lord, and the weight of being God is only meant for God to carry, not for us to carry. We try and carry it, then of course we're going to be anxious, even if it's for the things of God. This passage reads as if they're already anxious, and Paul could well be saying, don't keep anxious. Don't keep being anxious. Remember Paul speaking to them in the context where there's threats from outside, there's threats from inside? So that could well be the anything uh, they're not to be anxious about. But to be honest, sometimes I find it hard to distinguish between godly concern or empathy and ungodly anxiety or harassing and distracting care. Do you? And I reckon if we focus too much on that and get preoccupied, we're just going to turn inwards, aren't we? 
which is the very opposite as to what we're being told to do. There are a few things that I think Philippians clearly says. When something comes up that you're concerned about, we're not to focus on that, we're not to feed on that, but we're to turn to God and to pray, knowing that our lovingly heavenly Father is near. Anxious, pray. That's been a mantra since I've been working on Philippians. Anxious, pray. Anxious, pray. Try and get that into your, your head. You're anxious, immediately pray. It's like when my children were learning to swim on the beach. Um, it can be scary with all the water and the waves, and I'd say, oh, don't worry, mummy's here. If you remember saying that sort of thing, if you've, if you've got children, well, God says it to us. Jesus is near. Do not be anxious. Jesus is near. He's right by you. His spirit is in you. You can thankfully bring everything big and small to him. You don't have to be Lord. I don't have to be Lord. You have a Lord. I have a Lord. We have a Lord. Thank goodness. The only true Lord who created and rules over heaven and earth. Why would we worry about anything on earth when we have him near us? The response, of course, is thankfulness and peace. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 puts it simply, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Those words in verse 5, the Lord is near, also remind us that the Lord's return is near. So well, what we're going through now is temporary and needs to be viewed from that eternal perspective. So if you're anxious, turn to God and pray holding on to anxiety on fear, feeding on your anxiety or fear damages our joy. But praying and relying on Jesus brings joy, promotes joy. Now, I'm not saying never analyse when you're anxious. Sometimes it can be a bit of a helpful diagnostic tool. Uh, It can point out something being out of kilter, um, a competing idol or God, for example, um, this, that refrain through the book, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice, verse four. If we're anxious and not rejoicing in the Lord, it could be that we're rejoicing in something else. Um, if we think the world will fall apart if we fail in an exam or if we mess something up at work or if we get sick or if we get hurt, um, then, or if we don't look attractive, the world's gonna fall apart, then it probably means we've got a competing idol Um, So when we pray, hopefully God will reveal that to us. But sometimes it's worth having a bit of a look inwards there. Um, Sometimes we have to keep, uh, we find we keep feeding that anxiety because we're selfish or self-focused. And we we may need to repent of that false God or some other sin. The good thing is, though, that God will keep changing our perspective as we come to him with both our requests and our thanks. I just love this comforting verse at the end of chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It's on page uh, 6. All of us then who are mature should take this view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. We're we're a work in progress. (laughs) Only live up to what you've already attained. In all our very real challenges, we do need to remember that we have a loving Lord Because of this, we turn to him and pray. This brings peace. It keeps us safe. God's peace is like having guards sort of posted around our inner heart and in our mind protecting us. So how might it look? I'm going to road test it in a situation and one that that, um, could be quite close to your heart. Let's say you have a child who's rejecting the gospel or living inconsistently with the gospel. It's right to have a deep concern and sadness for that. But what isn't right is letting Satan accuse you, make you full of guilt, rob you um, of your deep core joy in Jesus, even in the midst of this crisis. So what do you do? Well, God says to pray specifically to him about it. Turn to him, call out to him, thank him that he can bring... Uh, that you can bring it to him, that he cares. You'd thank God that his love for your child is even greater than yours. And as you pray and look to God, you'd be protected from from, uh, taking shortcuts to relieve that very real pain. 
From my experience, there's two particular traps here. One is the temptation to try and change the gospel so you can widen it to bring your child in because you care for them so much. Uh, The other trap is it's so painful so you push your child away. Um, You're actually unloving, performance-based at that sense. But God's way, of course, as you're praying, um, is, is to keep loving and to keep hold of the gospel uh, and, and living with that tension with him as you, as you press on. One other thing is, that's worth saying is anxiety has a feeling component. We've got complicated bodies and emotions, like I was saying last time. Some feelings of anxiety could be nothing more than the result of hormones or chemicals or extreme sleep deprivation. Maybe in a broken world, some medicine will help um, to get the physical balance back. Maybe it won't in a particular case. But again, even if we don't know exactly what's going on, what we do know is look upwards to the Lord and pray. That remains no matter what we're feeling, no matter what our particular reality is. I don't know about you. Sometimes I get anxious because I'm anxious. <laughs> um, but an antidote to that, of course, is to keep looking up, looking at the Lord. Let's not get into that bind. Satan can um, use that guilt or anxiety to turn us inwards. Look up, remember that your Lord is near. So the second way to stand firm in the Lord and to have joy is not to take on the anxieties of the world ourselves, but to give them to God. He can handle it. To pray for ourselves and for others with thankfulness and knowledge that our loving and powerful Lord is near. We have great joy along the way as we see many answered prayers, but we'll also be kept safe for that final joy and we won't look at ungodly ways out of our predicament. The next area explored in chapter 4 of Philippians is, um, that will help us stand firm is, is to have disciplined thinking, dwelling on the good instead of focusing on the bad. Actually, it will also help us not to be anxious, won't it? Uh, we won't be looking for problems or we'd be, we'll be looking for what's good. So let's look at uh, chapter 4, verse 8 on page 7. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What we think about and dwell on affects how we think and feel. It's pretty un-Australian, but in our church communities, we're not to, we're to notice the good in people um, uh, and the good in their actions and their gifts. We're to hold up good examples, tell stories about heroes in the faith. We're not to look for where people have got it wrong or even delight when they get it wrong. We don't need to have that compulsive comparative syndrome we talked about for earlier. We need to find people, um, we don't need to find people to put down to make ourselves feel better. We're secure in Jesus so we can afford to see the good. And actually, again, that's very appealing to outsiders. We're not to have critical spirits within Jesus' family. If we do have to correct somebody, we'll do it gently and for their good. A critical spirit can be a fault of communities who who rightly focus on the truth, um, but forget grace and forgiveness. You know, the spot it and stop it kind of mentality you can find in some... You want both, don't you? You want truth in love. It needs to be together. In Jesus' family, we're not to be like the news coverage that focuses on all the failures and all the dirt, everything that's gone wrong in the world until you get to the panda story at the end. You know, we're we're actually to be ones looking for the good. And then seeking the good spills out into the way we approach the world. There's lots of evil in the world, um, but that's not to be our main focus. How can we expect joy if we're searching out the dirt, filling our minds with the rubbish, Um, can lead us also into all sorts of temptation and to follow all sorts of bad examples. There's lots of good in the world as well, God's good creation. Darkness likes darkness. That's why dirt stories sell. That's why pornography sells. That's why gossip entices. Does what you read or watch on TV or the internet stand up to that test? If not, then can I encourage you to resolve to make some changes? It may well be that you're filling your mind with things that aren't actually helping you. 
We're drawn, we're to be drawn to holiness, to beauty, to kind acts, to things that work well. We're to notice and enjoy what's good in God's world. And as we ponder that, then we can adopt those things for ourselves, the noble, the good practices that we see. Just as Paul goes on to say in verse 9, whatever you've learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. It's actually helpful to remember we're a, a people for God. That means there'll be th- there will be things we're against, but that's not primarily what, sh- primarily what shapes us or drives us. For example, we're for good marriages um, more than we're against wrong sex. We're for the good, the wholesome. Of course, dwelling on God and his words is the ultimate expression of what's true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Reading the Bible, listening to it, dwelling on what it says, um, including through days like today, shapes our thinking, helps us to recognise the good. I love listening to CDs that have Bible verses put to song. They'll be Think of ways that you can be encouraged to fill your mind with good things. Anything we good we learn from the Bible or from his people in the world, we're to put into practice. And the promise is that God, the God of peace, will be with us. The final joy promoter that Philippians explores is contentment, thankfulness, generosity. And these characteristics are all linked. And you'll see it on page eight. The opposite, of course, the joy killers are discontentment, greed, materialism, hedonism, or just plain stinginess. The Philippian gift to Paul and his response is actually a really good case study to finish uh, uh, today, and it sums up so much of what we've been looking at. Turn with me now at chapter 4, verses 10, starting at verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learnt to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel... When I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. One of the very appealing characteristics of the Philippian church was their generosity. They'd been generous to Paul before to support his ministry. And while Paul is thankful to them, you know, he says it was good of you to share in my troubles, he also uses receiving this gift as a teaching opportunity. The Philippians are under intense pressure and it's only going to get worse. It's critical that their faith and joy in the Lord isn't shaken by their circumstances now or whatever may happen in the future. And Paul wants to make sure that they stand firm and press on to the end. So how can they and we keep our joy in the Lord no matter what circumstances we face? Paul throughout the letter is setting himself up as a model for them to follow. He's been expressing his great joy in the Lord at every sign of God's work in the Philippians and in other believers' life. So here in verse 10, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord because of the gift that they sent to him while he was in prison. But the main reason for his rejoicing wasn't that he had his needs met. It was verse 12 and 13. I've learnt the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Can you imagine getting, the, getting a gift from someone and saying, look, I'm so glad for you that you've given me this. <laughs> it almost sounds rude, doesn't it? Um, 
but it highlights the transformational shift that we as Christians need to have from ourselves to God and others. What brings Paul joy here is that this generous gift, what it means about God's work in their lives and because God will bless them because God delights in what they've done. Verse 17, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. They, that is the gifts, are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So what do we learn from this? There's a few things. Firstly, Paul has contentment totally independent of his circumstances. He's content, this is the secret, because he trusts God and he knows God is working out his good purposes in the world, including through his circumstances. His joy and contentment is independent of his circumstances. Paul knows that he has forgiveness and a relationship with God now, that he has this prize in heaven where he and all believers um, will be like Jesus and glorify God forever. So he can be hungry now and still have contentment and joy. He can have actual need now and still have joy in Jesus. He doesn't feel like bereft or like God's abandoned him. And it is actually crucial that we understand this point. That's why I actually I really hate success theology with a passion. I've seen people's joy in Jesus robbed and their faith shattered because they've been taught that God has promised they'll be successful or wealthy or healthy or whatever it is. Their business will flourish. Their, uh, all their children will um, uh, love Jesus, whatever it is. Um, and then something goes wrong. And then they get blamed because they haven't got enough faith for making it happen. It's just cruel. Uh, and it's actually not what God has promised. How foolish of us to get shaken or disgruntled because God doesn't dance to our tune. God promises, though, that he'll give us strength to be content and to have joy and peace, to know forgiveness, to stand firm, not to sin, to press on uh, to our eternal glory, whatever the circumstances. And that is the all this in verse 12 that it's talking about. That's what God will give us strength to do, not to succeed in everything that pops into our head that we want to do. What amazing promises that the creator of the world has given us as his children. Let's rejoice in those extraordinary promises and hold on to those, not on to ones that we've invented for God. Similarly, when we have plenty, when things are going well, let's be thankful and enjoy those earthly gifts that God's given us. They're from his hand, but still, so we enjoy them, but still have our joy and contentment in Jesus. When things are tough, joy and contentment in Jesus. When things are wonderful, joy and contentment in Jesus. Secondly, we see that generosity, open-heartedness, open-handedness is evidence of God's gospel work in an individual and in a gospel community. When we're thankful for all Jesus has done uh, and all the riches we have in Christ, that'll naturally flow over with love and with generosity to others. I was once struck by a Christian artist who said, have you ever noticed that God has made the world unnecessarily beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Flowers could still attract the bees, even if they weren't quite so exquisite. Um, there's just no need for sunsets to be that spectacular. We have a God whose very nature is lavish, generous, lavishing on the undeserved, overflowing, giving. That is our God. That's what we want to show. Jesus gave up everything for our sakes. As that grips us, our response can only be thankfulness and generosity. And giving financially is a tangible expression of that, not being tight-fisted. It's an expression of God's work in our lives. And the flip side is that greed or stinginess, they're signs that we're actually not gripped by all that God has done, that we're not thankful, we're not seeking to bless others as we've been blessed. Or perhaps we just don't understand that we have everything that really matters, uh, so we're anxious and we think we've got to protect ourselves and give ourselves status now. Materialism, the love of things, or hedonism, the love of experiences, are the God of our age. But if you ask me if being greedy um, was one of my problems, I'd say, well, I don't really think it is. But actually, uh, take a minute to see if your real joy 
is in any of those things? What do you spend your spare time thinking about? or dreaming about, you know, is it the renovation or the latest cooking t- tool or the coffee shop or the holiday or the long service leave or, you know, there's all many things that could be the things that sort of you drift back to all the time. God gives us wonderful things, nothing wrong with enjoying them. But, for instance, I was finding I was getting a bit too preoccupied thinking about travel. So, you know, I decided to not, not be reading those um, escape sections for a little while of the newspaper. Just think through where it is that, that might be your soft spot. Perhaps it's not for yourself, but it's for your children where you've got issues. You're happy to do without things, um, but you want them to have every opportunity, every experience. We talked about it in our session, you know, there's this FOMO, fear of missing out. It might be for ourselves or it might be for our kids. But if we've got everything that really matters in Christ, that's not something that we need to hold on to. Think about your soft spot. Resolve um, to bring it to God um, and to keep growing in generosity and thankfulness. The Philippians as a community were generous and it's fascinating to see how generosity breeds generosity. In effect, we're receiving God's generosity through his people, responding again in generosity to his people, and it just keeps building and building. So, you know, have you been given a meal and you found it's helpful? Highly likely you'll do a meal for somebody else. Did somebody pay for you to come today? Don't be surprised if you think of doing it for somebody else, you know, further down the track. It's that kind of generosity breeds generosity. So the next thing we learn from the case study is that Paul has real joy now and he rejoices greatly because of the evidence of God's work he sees in the Philippians' life. Paul once again is more pleased for them than for himself. He really cares about them. He has affection for them. Otherwise, their growth would be neither here or there to him. We also see that Paul has joy now in seeing the fruits of of his gospel labour in them. Verse 1 in this chapter says, he calls them his joy and crown. He alludes to the fact that on the last day, they'll stand with him before Jesus and that will bring him even more joy and blessing. Look for signs of that in your own life, that you care about gospel growth in others. Do you pray for gospel growth? Do you ask people how they're going in various areas in their life? Do you teach children in schools or at church or youth or young believers? Do you work on the logistics or administration so that others can do uh, other ministry? Are you, related, uh, are you related when you see someone grasp a, crisp, a Christian truth or, or mature in some way? Remember, the Christian life isn't just about you and God. It's actually a family walk. But finally, not only does generosity bring um, more generosity and thankfulness, it actually brings God joy. God doesn't need anything. Even though he set up the Old Testament sacrificial system, he made it very clear that it wasn't because he needed sacrifices, but it was out of his kindness to make a way for an unholy people to um, come and approach a holy God. These sacrifices pointed towards Jesus' sacrifice. Within this sacrificial system, God's people could actually give thank offerings to God. And the Old Testament said that when these thank offerings were burnt, it was done, and it was done with an obedient and grateful heart. The smell or aroma was pleasing to God. You can see that in uh, Exodus twenty nine eighteen or Leviticus three sixteen. So our generosity now is in the same category. A sacrificial thank offering, Paul says in verse four, verse, chapter four, verse eighteen, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. We're not like Hindus or Buddhists or Muslims who gain spiritual credit by doing good deeds. Um, Our giving is in response to being saved by a lovingly generous father. And it actually brings our God much joy when we are generous, when we give. Even though we're so often aware of our sin, isn't it wonderful to think that you can actually give God joy? Uh, by the way you serve and by the way you give. In the end, God will be glorified. Apart from the final greetings in this letter, it, it finishes with a focus on God's glory. We know verse 19, the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 
That's why we have joy in Jesus now, rejoice in Jesus now, although sometimes we'll struggle to live in the reality of that, of all that we have in Jesus, we can have joy in Jesus regardless, irrespective of our circumstances. We have true joy in Jesus as we stand firm and then as we press on to that final day, that final day of glory. And may God increasingly make true for each of us what we have on this bookmark, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Westminster Catechism, it's a teaching tool that was put together by Puritans in the 17th century, has, this first, has lots of questions and answers. And the very first one is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. A time will come when God will be fully glorified and our joy in Jesus will be total. It will be uncontested. We will rejoice that this promise of God has come true. Uh, We will know it in its fullness. Let's rejoice now in the truth of that. And let's finish this session by saying together the words that will be on our lips for eternity. It's the word that Paul uses in chapter 4, verse 20. To God the Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.